Hi, everyone. My name is Shanna Hesketh with Trauma Law California. And this is our first podcast episode where I sit down and talk to my old mock trial coach, my old boss, and my general kind of life mentor, Chuck McGill. We talk about some of our funny stories from the courtroom and just kind of some general nuggets from our legal careers. Okay, so today we're going to sit down and talk to my old mock trial coach, Chuck McGill, who also was my boss at one point in time and also is kind of just my general life mentor. Um, his, Him and his wife are a large part of why I am a criminal defense attorney here today, and his son now works for me. It's a full family thing, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I just kind of weaseled myself into the Ooh. McGill family and just kind of... Never left. <laughs> I you, just kind of declared myself part were, of the you gang. You adopted in. <laughs> Fair and square. Fair and square, you adopted it. That actually came up at one of the awards ceremonies. I think it was my senior year. Laura was announcing the awards for our team, um, and she made a joke about adopting me or something, which is obviously a joke because I wasn't actually adopted by you guys, not in any sort of legal or you know, um, regular sense. Um, and my mom was livid with that. <laughs> she did not like that remark. Um, but it, it just kind of goes to show how close we've become over the years. Realistically, I was 15 when I met you. Yeah, I, that's probably why you're so intimidated by the knife I pulled out. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so very first time yeah. I ever met you, yeah. um, you and Laura were my mock trial coaches and you had been in trial or something. So you hadn't been to practice in a while. Um, and it was Christmas vacation and we are going to meet at the school and watch uh, my cousin Vinny to learn some trial skills. So uh -huh. we're going to watch my cousin Vinny and Chuck comes in wearing this. It's just like absolutely iconic in my mind to this wool suit. It's a three piece suit like what he's wearing today. But it's wool and it has a pinstripe, but not a regular pinstripe like this, a chalked pinstripe. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like very mafioso. Um, and as he's walking into the room, he just pulls a knife out of his breast pocket, which was very intimidating to a room full of 15 year olds. But then it turned out he had brought breakfast burritos. So it all ended up to be OK. But it was a very large knife that you pulled out of the pocket. Yeah, it was. I, I, I remember it was a. Uh... One of my bigger, um, like what's a your, chef's what, knife. Chef's knife, yeah. I was yeah. Like, I want to say it was probably had a fourteen inch blade on it. <laughs> I was trying to make sure that that all of you fifteen year olds knew who was in charge. I, I think we knew. Yeah, I yeah, think that. Yeah. It, I mean, it certainly made an impression. Seventeen right, years right. later, I still, um, right. I, I still have that ingrained in my mind to the point that um, when I saw this suit up for sale, it had pinstripes and reminded me of you. So I, right. I bought it, and it's my Chuck suit. So I uh, wore it for our Chuck conversation today. Win many trials in that suit, young lady. Win many trials in that suit. I speak it over. <laughs> I appreciate that. Now you, if I was to try and describe your legal career, I think I would say that you are a criminal defense attorney, but more than that, you are a trial attorney. I think that's kind of where your magic lies as in trial work. Would you agree? Absolutely. And so as I was preparing for this conversation, I was trying to go through and think about some of your fun trial stories that I've heard over the mm. years. Um, one story that I quasi remember, and maybe you can fill us in on the details, sure. was um, I seem to recall at some point the Fresno County District Attorney's Office started filing a motion in limine to prevent you from changing into costumes during trial. Yes, that happened. Yeah. Can you give me the details on that? Sure. Um, I had decided that when I did um, particularly drunk driving trials, because quite frankly, all the jurors hadn't experienced that, that particular kind of crime. You know, everybody who drinks is driven drunk at one point or another in their life. And so they're, it's really easy for them to believe that everybody that's accused of drunk driving is guilty. Okay. And so it was my goal to con, you know, tell, the, tell the jury that the cop is lying. 
and no one wants to believe that. So I would change in the costume. I would say I'm Diamond Jim, the riverboat gambler, and I would change into this costume in front of the jury. And it was a, it was a, it was a vest that I got bought at the Civil Civil War reenactment that looked like something from the 1850s. And I had a gold chain I put across it, and I remember I had like a bolo tie, and I had a cowboy hat, and I would just change this into this outfit in front of the jury. And the whole time I'm narrating, saying. Well, so you're know. actively speaking. Court reporter is typing, and you are changing clothes, putting on this costume, going from Chuck McGill, the trial lawyer, to Jim, the riverboat gambler. Yes, yes. Okay. And I was doing that because I'm telling the jury, you know, I'm an officer of the court. I've been sworn to uphold the California state constitution. The police officer sitting here is an officer of the court. He was sworn to uphold the state constitution. So for me to call him a liar... It just seems to be completely inappropriate because we should be on the same page. However. We should be on the same side, the justice side. Correct, side of justice. However, once I become Diamond Jim, the riverboat gambler, well, I'm not going to have a problem whatsoever talking about this officer taking his position and running with it the best way he can. And I would analogize it to you know, playing poker and how you'd, you wouldn't know what you're going to get. You get the first two cards and they flop and you really don't know what you have until you see the whole flop. But you got to bet. And I would analogize his report writing as making a bet on the first contact he had with somebody. Even if that first contact was a flop. Correct. Correct. So you said something I wanted to follow up on. Um, no one wants to believe that the cop could lie. Nobody wants to believe that the cop would be dishonest or untruthful or even wrong on the stand. And I think that's something that comes up a lot in trial work in different kind of cases. Um, I do personal injury also, and there's a lot of personal injury attorneys who, um, especially attorneys that do medical malpractice, which is a part of personal injury. I don't typically do that type of work, but you hear the stereotypical situation where this comes up is a lot of female plaintiffs who are suing their doctor for not finding the breast cancer early enough or the mammogram not being correct or, you know, this failure to diagnose the breast cancer. In those cases, even if the evidence is all on your side, a lot of attorneys will say they're very hard to prove simply because jurors don't want to believe that that's something that can happen because right. if it can happen to you, it can happen right. to me. Right. And this, I feel like that comes up a lot in car accident cases too. Like, Oh, well, you know, the, she couldn't have possibly had a, you know, mild traumatic brain injury that screwed her life up in this way, that way, and the other way, because the car didn't look that bad. And so if you can get this big of an injury from this small of an accident, if that could happen to you, well, that could happen to me too. Yeah. And I don't want to believe that that could happen. So I'm, I'm going to make you work twice as hard to win your right, case. Right. And sometimes working twice as hard to win your case is apparently dressing up and taking on an alter ego of Diamond Jim, the riverboat gambler, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is you've got you've to recognize that we all come in to the courts with our prejudices, just like you talked about in the auto cases. Everybody doesn't want to believe that, you know, a fender bender is going to cause someone to have traumatic brain injury, which it can. And they exhibit A, exhibit A, fender bender, and they GBI. don't, and they don't want to believe that they don't want to believe that can happen because they can have to realize it's shit that could happen to me, and so you've got to get people to think outside of the the box. And I guess in order to get people, aka jurors, to think outside the box, you as the trial lawyer have to think outside the box to inspire that. I think so, and and you know, uh, as we were talking about my uh, late wife Laura. She was one of those that was a real strong believer in demonstrative evidence. And demonstrative evidence for the public would be um, pictures, posters, drawings, things that would lead the jury to see what happened in the case through some example or diagram. So speaking of examples or diagrams and demonstrative, maybe not evidence, but it, it was certainly a demonstration I right. seem to recall a story that involved your tie. Right, right. This one was a um, it was a funny, funny case. Um, 
I tried it in front of my civil procedures teacher, Ollie Wanger, who was a district court judge at that time, head of the head of the federal bench in Fresno. And I was a, representing a kid who had the unique unique philosophy that he would go on the internet and into chat rooms and invite anybody to show him his penis. You want to see my penis? Is the first comment he'd make in a chat room. It didn't matter. Just walk in and ask. Didn't matter who it was. That What's responded. that? Um, I feel like there was an episode of How I Met Your Mother or some TV show or something like that where there's just this random naked guy where like you go on the date, the date's not even going well. They're talking about how they didn't, you know, didn't anticipate anything happening, but then they walk in and he's just sitting there naked and it's like, well, I guess I'll have sex with him. And so maybe this is your client's perspective. I'm just going to walk into this chat room and see if everybody wants to see my penis and, and maybe somebody will want to. I don't know. I, I don't know what was his motive. I assume that he was very proud of his member because it was a very large penis and he was a very small guy. So it really <laughs> stood out. And uh, I remember in that particular trial in front of Judge Wanger, I was using that argument that basically he was addicted to pornography and he was addicted to um, uh, having women look at his penis. And he wasn't li really trying to look for children. He was just whoever was there. Mm -hmm. And um, I argued that um, I'd read a story about a boy who had ridden the dragon, and it was an analogy of the prince who's fallen, been taken by the devil. And, um, and so it talked about how this king ran a, ran, ran a, he was a king, and this was his son, the prince, and ba basically the devil was, was um, the example was the devil was, the, was a dragon. And kind of luring him in. Luring him into evil. Okay, and, and the and I and, and I use that analogy. And about so his addiction to his large dick was lured same, him into his, his criminal his conduct. Criminal conduct, exactly. That he had no intent to commit crime. He just was led into it, step by step. And um, so I told this fairy tale, and the, as the story goes, that he rides the dragon, and after he rides the dragon, he loves flying around the. A community, but while well, they're flying around, the dragons burning people, <laughs> and he's having to deal with the guilt of burning his dad's citizens and his own citizens, and or in your client's case, the occasional child in a chat room. Correct, correct. Which I thought was a perfect analogy. I see where you're going with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And so I was doing all of that, and, um, and how he would get scales from riding it. They got worse and worse. And so then, I as I was telling this to the jury. I'm like, you know, I think we need to think about this, riding this dragon. And I happened to have a tie that had this pattern on it that looked like dra like a, the scales, dragon print. Okay. And I said, so as I'm looking at the jury, I'm like, why, look, it was a dragon, just like my tie. Do you see the scales on my tie? Do you see how easy it would be to be pulled into this addiction? And I remember looking over at... Um, Judge Wanger, in the federal courts, they seem to sit like 20 feet above everybody else. It's very tall. Very tall. And he, re I remember him looking down at me with a very strange look like, what in the hell are you going to do in my courtroom? <laughs> and I pulled my tie off and I stretched it out so the jury could see it. I said, I want you to visualize this tie as being the dragon. And I started waving it around. And by, by then, he was up over his bench looking at me like, are you insane? <laughs> And I didn't know this, but apparently the bailiffs in, in the federal building are most of them are retired police officers. Well, as soon as I pulled my tie off, they all started to pack the room because they thought it was hilarious. And they wanted to see how long it would go, I would, could go on before a wanger threw me in jail. <laughs> and so I merrily danced around the courtroom with this tie, waving it around. And I said, he's riding the dragon, you know, and going around my client and whipping, the, whipping my tie around his head, he's riding the dragon. <laughs> and it was just very funny. Um, it was unsuccessful, however. The jury did, still found him guilty, but not as many charges as he was facing. Well, and I really think that that's, um, 
that's the important thing to understand in criminal defense practice is sometimes a win isn't it's really nice when it's an across the board not guilty right. and acquittal and your client leaves the courtroom with you it's very nice when that happens i thoroughly enjoy it i've had the pleasure of having that happen a couple of times and just getting those sweeping jury verdicts that are a hundred percent in our favor but in criminal defense practice sometimes you don't get that full sweep. Sometimes you get, you know, count four instead of counts one through four. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get, you know, those different, um, those differing levels of success. And unless you're looking for those little wins, unless you're accepting those little wins, it can really, or I don't want to say little wins, but maybe smaller wins, it can be very um, disheartening. And I feel like there's a lot of trial lawyers or a lot of criminal defense lawyers who don't even show up, don't even set trials, don't even do, don't even fight those cases to the full extent because they're afraid of losing. And instead, they're just taking whatever the DA has to offer. And I really feel like that's such a disservice, not only to your client, but to all the clients. Because once the DAs feel like they can get away with that, when nobody's holding their feet to the fire, mm -hmm. it's amazing what they're going to try and um, pull over everyone else. And yeah. so even if you're not getting the full sweep, the full not guilty, it... Um, it still shows a huge commitment to your client that you would be willing to show up, that you would be willing to fight, that you'd be willing to, you know, integrate this fairy tale into your client's, I guess, grim fairy tale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you, you've got to, you know, it. your point's well taken, and, and probably the, the reputation and the reason why we started with that motion about me not being able to change in, that, in the costume during a closing argument, um, which he lost, of course, by the way. Um, but the point is, even though I don't win every case I'm in, there's blood and scratches all over the DA after I'm done with the trial because I've given everything I've got, and it's a miserable experience for them to be in trial with me. So... Um, that particular DA, whoever I've tried a case with, is going to be much more reticent about not giving me an offer that's going to settle the case, you know. And the reality is, you know, 90% of cases that you're going to get, they're going to settle. Right. But I'm going to get a different offer because there's a chance I might take them to trial and it's going to cost them, you know. And that's been my whole philosophy throughout my career. And I see it's yours too. <laughs> I, I, and um, I just I look I just tickled to death for your clients. <laughs> well, and one of the things that I've kind of incorporated into my practice, especially on the criminal defense side, is getting involved early. These clients have been hiring me, you know, if not the afternoon, but the day that they get out of jail, and I've been able to really harass the ever loving crap out of the DA. Mm -hmm. And show them that they don't want to fight me on this. Right. That if they file, they're going to be wasting their precious, precious resources. They're so understaffed right now. Um, really kind of letting them know that I don't mind trying this. That I have X, Y, and Z evidence. And mm -hmm. if you want to allow me to get this in front of a jury, mm -hmm. you know damn well I'm going to beat you. Right. Um, and that's worked out pretty well for us, especially in the last several months. So Well, it does work when, you, when you're showing your opponent that you're going to outwork them right from the beginning. Um, and that's really the key is you know, letting them know that I'm going to outwork you. You may have better facts than I do, but by God, I'm going to do everything I can to outwork you in, produ in producing those facts. And that's, to me, is, is the joy it is. of being a private attorney versus being a, a, a public defender that has four or 500 cases that they get the day they're there and they have to resolve all of them. Well, and that kind yeah. of brings me to another thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so obviously I've known you since I was 15. You were you and Laura were a huge part of my life around the time that my brother was killed. Mm -hmm. And I just remember just about every single court hearing sitting there 
watching as these cases are getting called. These defendants are all looking at their attorney like confused. They don't know what's going on. Criminal defense attorneys have a tendency to speak in code. It's 977 this or 1050 that, 1368 something else. Mm -hmm. And if you don't speak the language, if you don't know the lingo, if you're not in on what's going on, it can be very terrifying. It can be overwhelming. And so even though you, it wasn't your case, even though it wasn't Laura's case, even though you guys, you know, weren't representing anybody in this case, as those things would come up or as things would come up in, in our case, if the prosecutor wasn't necessarily under, explaining it in a way that I understood, I would turn to you guys to get that information. And it just, even just having the simple questions answered just made me feel so much more secure, made me feel like, I knew what was going on. And so because I knew that X, Y, and Z was going to happen, I wasn't taken off guard by that. And that's a philosophy that I've really tried to bring into my own personal practice with my clients is introducing this information, um, A, in this type of a format, telling clients or potential clients on the internet, hey, this confusing thing is going to happen um, but here's what is happening. Here's why, here's what my game plan is to do about it. Or here's the options that your attorney might explore if you're not already one of my clients and just kind of unveiling the like mystic nature of the Fresno County Superior Courthouse of the criminal justice process. And, and my kind of theory on this is that the traumatic, the, the legal system itself is traumatic enough your lawyer should be there helping you to make it less so, helping you to understand what's going on, should be making that information so readily available. And I feel like a lot of the reason why I have that philosophy is because you and Laura were so accessible to me during that time answering my questions, and it just kind of became ingrained in me, the sense of peace that it kind of brought to me, and I want to be able to offer that to my clients as well. You know, everything that happens to us in life has a uh, reason for happening. Mm -hmm. And um, the great lawyers are always present and they're, and they're, they're, they're uh, paying attention to what's happening in front of them. And as I'm sitting here looking at this 15-year-old girl that I saw grow up and to be the talented criminal defense and private uh, PI attorney that she is, I look at your life and those experiences you've had and you've integrated them into your practice. I mean, as sorry as I am that you've suffered the injuries <laughs> that you've suffered, I believe you needed to suffer those injuries in order to become the great lawyer that you're becoming. Oh, now. of course. I, I would agree with that 100%. And just like you just said, you, you tell your clients about what's happening in their case and the reason why is because you know how... Uh, mystifying it is to be in that position without having somebody lead them through it because you've been there and because uh, you did that for me and that's because I've because it was done for me I mean I that's part of the the, the I've never lost sight of the fact that I represent people who have no idea what's going on in the system and it's my job to teach them about it you and know? I think the beauty of that is that we represent people whether they know what's going on or not, yeah. whether they're confused or confident or whatever is going on, we represent people. We're not, you know, one of those, at least for me, and I don't think for you either, you know, we're not those big firms representing insurance companies where we've got to go through six chains of command in order to get authority to do something on our case. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have supervisors that we're answering to where I've got to get permission to make X, Y, Z offer or do something on a case. I work directly with my clients to get the best results possible, to take care of them the best way. And I, I kind of feel like you've always done the same thing as well with yeah. your clients, working directly with them hand in hand, side by side, eliminating that chain that hierarchy of what they've got to do to talk to their lawyer right right i uh, that's why my my phone's on 24 7 i'm available to my clients you know some of them will call me at 10 o'clock at night to ask me something that's not related to their case and that kind of pisses me off <laughs> but but i teach them that too <laughs> you know um 
it's part of the process. And uh, no, I, it's it's wonderful to, to help people. Yeah. And the and the thing that is lost in a lot of professions is that we're helpers, and that's our job. Our, our job is to help people, and particularly as a lawyer, your job is to help your client. Very much so. And part of it is the a mental and emotional process of what they're going through and being there for them on that too. Yeah. I remember um, one of the kind of defining moments for me in deciding that I was going to do criminal defense work was at the sentencing in my brother's murder case. He had been killed. The two boys that shot him were on trial for murder. They had been inevitably convicted of voluntary manslaughter instead of murder. And so now they were going to be sentenced for that crime. They were going to be sentenced for the voluntary manslaughter. And um, I remember looking around the courtroom thinking, like, these boys are going to get out of prison someday. Someday in my lifetime, they're going to be out. And who here in this courtroom is going to make sure that they don't kill someone else's brother when they get out? Like, who here... Who here is going to have the biggest impact on that? Probably not the jury because they're the reason why they're getting out in the first place. Probably not the prosecutor who has been talking about the worst five minutes of their life for, you know, the last year that we've been going through this process. Probably not the judge who just called them cold and calloused and talked about all the reasons why, you know, she was sentencing them to prison time. And really, that only left the defense attorneys. Um, they were the only ones left in the room. And I just kind of started to think about the impact that these defense attorneys might have on the lives of their clients and how maybe it meant something to these boys, to these these young men that shot my brother. Maybe it meant something to them that somebody came to court every single day, that somebody showed up for them, that somebody got their knuckles <coughs> dirty in a courtroom fighting like hell for them to be able to have a life at some point. Maybe that is going to make a difference for them. Maybe I could do that one day. And then after I got done giving my victim impact statement, I don't know if you remember this, but I was sobbing hysterically, turned around, and there you were at the back of the courtroom opening the door immediately so that I could escape. Mm -hmm. And just go sob in the hallway in private. Mm -hmm. That's one of those moments that I'll kind of always remember, along with your knife suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully they are; those memories will stay in, in check with one another. <laughs> hopefully, I don't com confuse them where you're pulling a knife on me at the right, courthouse. Right. Right. Well, that's possible too. <laughs> you never but, know. Maybe you had a bad day at work. No, you know the the. the as you're saying that, realistically, and I don't, I think it's lost once again on the public the impact that a defense lawyer can have on their client. And as you were saying that about these young men, they had two choices after after they were sentenced. One of them is to go and do their time in prison and get nothing from it. Right. Just be embittered about the fact that they are in prison versus walking freely and not facing the consequences of their actions. That's one option. And then the other option is someone to speak into them. Right. And give them an opportunity to actually have a value in life after the fact and maybe give back. Right. You know, and maybe replace the things that your brother would have done with his life in other people's lives, if that makes any sense. Right. And, it's, and the only person that's going to speak that over them and into them is their attorney. The only person who's in a position to speak that to them. Mm -hmm. And what, into their life is there a sure? Journey? What are you going to do? I mean, I've, I've bought you your freedom to at some point in life. What are you going to do to earn it? How are you going to pay back? Yeah, you know, and and um, and it, who knows? I mean, I've been in that position where I'm looking at a client that I'm talking to that is, was looking at prison for the rest of their life, and I said, okay, now you've got ten. That's a long time. I know you're 18 years old, and hell, that's half your life. But it could have been. Forever. So what are you going to do? 10 is better than 60. What are you going to do after that 10 years is up? How are you going to pay back? Um, I've often had people ask me, 
Shanna, how could you represent people like this? What? How can you stand in a courtroom and fight for somebody that is charged with murder when your brother was killed? How, how can you possibly do that? And it, the case that comes to mind for me is I, at one point in time, represented a kid who was arrested as part of this big MS-13 bust, and he was charged with two counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and another count of conspiracy to commit assault with a deadly weapon to wit a knife. There's gang enhancements. There's gun enhancements. There's dangerous and deadly weapon personal arming enhancements. All kinds of things going on. He had cases here in Fresno, down in L.A., in his federal in uh, the federal courthouse. And all in all, between all of his cases, his maximum exposure was somewhere around 200 years. Yeah. And... I tell people this because in those cases, my job is, it'd be nice if I could get them off scot-free, but in a lot of cases, that's not possible. And when I was able to plead him to a, a offer that would give him a life after prison, when I was able to get him sentenced to 12 years for two homicides, basically a buy one, get one murder... I call that a win in my book. My client called that a win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was especially fulfilling for me because this kid, nobody had ever shown up for him in his life except for fellow gang members. You know, he'd been in MS since he was four years old. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he was in El Salvador. And mm -hmm. these are just the people that showed up to take care of him when mm -hmm. nobody else would. And so because of that, he just kind of was grown up into it. And the only people who ever showed up to fight for him were gang members. And I told him at the very early stages of the case, my goal in this case, sure, it'd be great if I got you off these charges. Sure, it'd be great if, you know, we got not guilty across the board and everything was dismissed. But my number one goal in this case is to show you that you don't have a you don't have to join a gang for somebody to show up and fight like hell for you, for somebody to protect you, for somebody to care about you, for somebody to want what's best for you. You can get that outside of a gang. And I don't know that I ever fully got there, but I hope that, you know, as he does those 12 years, that he, he thinks about that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's the, that's the, it's, it's so, I, I can see why it would be hard for the public, and I, it's always the question that I've been asked for, gosh, <laughs> 35 years almost now, how do you represent people, you know, who have committed crimes? And I said, how are they any different than us? Right. It's one mistaken decision. Assuming you have the right to make a decision. When you talk about that young man, when he was four, he deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison? Right. No, he didn't. And if he was raised by the gang, is, did that give him any choices? Right. No. No, I mean, you know, when you get on an individual basis and level with someone, and that's what we're called to do. Um, and you're doing a great job of it, by the way. Thank you. Um, the, you don't get there without realizing that we're all flawed. And we have the, and we have the opportunity it's an exercise in humility and yeah, grace. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I was talking to a girlfriend of mine um, a couple weeks ago. I had just gotten a rape case dismissed, and she was asking me, like, how can you represent people like that? Like, what if he actually did rape her? And I'm like, well, but how did Christ go to the cross for that? Because it's the same thing. The answer is still, well, it's certainly not the same sacrifice, but it's the same answer. It's with a whole lot of grace mm -hmm. and a whole lot of grace for my client and being willing to show up and show them that they're worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you should say that. I mean, I would get that question most often in the Pentecostal circles I'd run in. <laughs> They'd all be shocked about the concept of me being, you know, faith and faithful believer. And how many of them did you end up representing? Quite a few, <laughs> quite a few. You know? <laughs> and it's just just because we're all broken, and and the courts are where we our brokenness gets shown. You know, it's just remarkably uh, um, common. Very it, much so. 
So when you're in stuck in the position of being made a bad decision or put yourself in a bad place, it could be the right place, the wrong time, wrong time, wrong, wrong place, right time. When you're in those kind of wrong pos- friends, wrong friends, you know, wrong turn off. You know, who knows? There's so many coincidences and chances that people get into trouble through their own actions, through inactions or just coincidence. You're going to want somebody that's already looking past the fact that you've been accused of something and try to defend you against the government. Because once the government moves, for whatever reason, and it's typically political, you need to have somebody that's willing to fight that and unafraid of the consequences of fighting vigorously for your defense. You're going to want somebody who knows how to move in on a case before the government has made a decision on it, before the government has Mm -hmm. decided to file on it. Mm -hmm. Because really, that's where I've had some of my best luck in taking care of people is getting involved in those cases very early on before they've decided that they want a pound of flesh on this. And 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 that causes, it's one of those things that it's another part of educating the public, and that is... When you get accused of crime, there's, you know, there's the shame and all that other kind of stuff that goes along with being accused of a crime that you don't want to confront it. But if you do confront whatever you're accused of immediately and hire you to represent them, then you can actually use that time for the benefit of them, you know, of their case. You can be proactive. Sure. You can know the facts. You can know the facts of what happened by talking to your client and feed those facts in whatever way looks appropriate to the district attorney that's handling the case and explain to him how he's going to fail if he I pursues see, it. I see this a lot in domestic violence cases. That's mm-hmm. where I get a lot of these non-file results from, mm-hmm. um, where the police officer is writing a report about one moment, one decision, one moment that's happening in one argument of a couple's relationship, but... And the report that's getting sent over to the DA's office, it's only covering that small facet of the situation. And so if we can find, sure, those facts might not look great for my client, but if we can do the research, if we can investigate, if we can do what needs to be done and find more facts that are maybe a little bit more favorable, that maybe justify some sort of self-defense argument or some reason to believe that you were in danger and needed to protect yourself against this spouse or, or whatever the fact may be, if we can find more fa- more facts, better facts, shed light on those and really kind of impact the lenses that the DA is looking at that report through before they ever even get the report, I mean, oh, that's, huge. that's huge. Yeah, It's life-changing for it, people. Right, and uh, this, in, and uh, the other... And when you say the domestic violence thing, that's one of those that's like, it's a burr under my saddle. You know, um, the public is unaware that it's the only crime that an officer can be investigating. And if he fails to file a complaint or file a report naming somebody as being responsible, he could be charged with a misdemeanor. Right. And as a result of that, when they... Officer arrives on scene, he's already made the determination someone is going to be arrested for domestic violence, regardless of whatever facts come out, is because I have to protect myself now. He's had, no longer an objective party. Right. You know? I, uh, I had this weird situation come up a couple of months ago. It's the first time in... All the time that I've been working in criminal defense, whether I was working for you, working for a different lawyer, or in the time that I've been a lawyer, this was the first time that I had a law enforcement officer call me to tell me that my client was not guilty of this, that the arrest never should have been made, and that it was stupid. And he called me to make sure that I knew that I needed to fight for this person, to that they shouldn't be convicted. Um uh, And he called me to give me the whole scoop on the marriage because he'd been investigating the alleged victim spouse for several crimes and things that were going on. And he'd come to know the family quite well. And so he wanted to make sure that I knew everything that he knew. 
And he kind of filled me in on some of the process, how, yes, Fresno PD has policies where it's not just you should arrest somebody, but you must arrest in these circumstances. You shall. Yes. And that, you know, they've got all these policies about how to deal with domestic violence cases. And then you kind of look at the case law and the way that it's and the evidence code sections and the way that they've changed with certain big ticket or, or big media domestic violence cases. The one that comes to mind is O.J., Um, And how the evidence code in certain case law changed about what evidence can be admissible and changing, you know, hearsay exceptions, all because the DA got spanked on a case back in L.A. in the 90s. And our clients are still paying the price for some of that today. Well, you know, it's it's funny you should mention that because one of the things I think the other thing the public doesn't see is is um, criminal defense is actually very political. Prosecution is very political. It's all it's the, almost like it's a politically elected position or something. Yeah, right. Like Wild. The, isn't it crazy? And the concept that the laws that are written are written by politicians. Isn't it shocking that politicians are writing political laws? It's so weird. It is very strange. And the public doesn't seem to get that. They think that the laws come out of this vacuum of justice. It doesn't even, they don't even contemplate that We're to, not in the days where it's handed down on golden tablets. Yeah, anymore. And I, I mean, even that was probably political too. I suspect <laughs> who was chosen to get the tablets, who got the chance to read them, you know, who got to interpret them. So, but when you look at that particular area of like domestic violence, it's probably the area you're going to find most people who've never had contact with law enforcement, who've never had the contact with the criminal justice system coming into the system. And by coming into the system, you mean getting arrested. Getting arrested. I would say the top two for those. Mm -hmm. Well, a third is far behind it. But most common would be a DUI, Mm -hmm. domestic violence after that. And then the one that I see people getting thrust into the system with absolutely no warning and very confused, not understanding how they got there on occasion is... Sex crimes. Yeah, I mean it's funny. I was, I was, that's exactly right. And it's the most and and those that panoply trifecta. trifecta of crimes that we're talking about. They've made laws so it's easier to prosecute those types of laws. I mean, the, here's the here's a logical one that just always kills me, and that is, in, particularly in a sex crime. Well, the victim's word alone is enough. If a jury believes that the victim's telling them the truth. Um, then Even if there's no corroboration. No corroboration, no evidence to support it, no external information, and th- and it's stale. It's something that happened years and years ago, and they have... Something that is alleged to have happened years and years and right. years ago. Well, something may have happened, or, or maybe there's something, maybe some people are lying too, and God help us if that's the case, because we're not set up for, for lies. Um, Certainly not if one witness's testimony can carry the day. Yeah, isn't it? but it, it, it defies your logic. I mean, as a reasonable person, you'd think, well, shoot, I want to hear somebody tell me something happened, and then there's going to be evidence to support that because otherwise, how do I know if they're telling me the truth when I don't know anything about them? Right. But the law allows that because of our issues as a society with uh, sexuality and fear. Of, uh, of being of people being victimized by other people, it's just, and it's you know, um, it's easy as a prosecutor, or I mean, it's easy as a politician, to say, well, let's change the law so it makes it easier for a victim of alleged abuse to testify, and that's enough evidence to produ- to produce a verdict. And it's let's just change shocking. the hearsay exception so that OJ doesn't right. get acquitted. Exactly. Well, let's change the law as far as domestic violence and make sure that every time an officer comes on the scene of an argument between husband and wife, that he makes a report and someone's arrested so we can use that as a motive to prove that he murdered somebody. And maybe let's put some grant money behind it too to entice these prosecutors to file these cases. Oh, and maybe we should put some money behind um, programs that are focused on teaching classes to um, deal with domestic violence. Like, let's put millions of dollars in there, by the way, so that now that we have a whole society built up economically to prosecute a crime that didn't exist until the politicians decided it was a crime. <laughs> 
Not know? to say that beating your wife or your husband is a great idea, but it's just, it's been economized. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. recent years. Yeah, and it's, you know, boys is probably going to sp- put some head spin in here when you're, <laughs> when you're talking about the fact that, that domestic violence is being used as an economic vehicle for the courts. That's a scary thought. And, it is. And it would spin the heads of people because, you know, well, how could there be anything wrong? Kind of brings us back to our uh, Diamond Jim Riverboat Gambler aspect that people uh, don't want to believe that that could be happening. Well, there, you know, it's just like Diamond Jim the Riverboat Gambler. You just got to go with what you feel. And, boy, that's changed too, by the way. After we saw... A uh, police officer put his knee on the neck of a man accused of passing a, a fake bad, twenty, b- fake twenty, and and suffocate him. The jury has a whole different view now of of what officers are capable of because we all watched it. It was over and over and over again on the news. And my understanding is now law enforcement agencies that don't have the body cameras for the police officers are having a very difficult time of having a jury believe what the officer's telling them as just being evidence of what happened. Well, and I'm curious to see what happens in Fresno County. Mims recently retired, and Mims... I love Sheriff Mims. However, she, for years, has resisted the notion of putting body-worn cameras on her deputies. Mm -hmm. And so Fresno Mm -hmm. County Sheriff's Office is one of the few law enforcement agencies around here that doesn't have body cameras. And you want to, this is, no, I don't have a statistical basis to say this, but I'm within the system. Right. And I've spoken to many, uh, a court clerk, and basically those are the folks that are sitting in the courtrooms while a jury is going on. And they've represented to me that the law enforcement agency in Fresno County that has the least amount of convictions is a case that's been investigated by the Fresno County Sheriff's Office. Because basically the jurors are in the opinion, if you have the capability of having a camera on you and you don't, why not? Especially since we all walk around with cameras on us. We've got our phone cameras. I mean, it it makes no logical sense. And I think part of the problem that, that Sheriff Mims had with this is that, you know, and, 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 and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I'm of that generation. And that she just didn't see the writing on the wall. That things are different now than they were when she was young. And she's and you're not you're not putting your officers in a position where they could be exposed to being prosecuted for their conduct because they did something wrong. You're putting them in the position to protect themselves. And protect themselves, protect the defendant, protect justice yes, all around because we yeah. don't have to rely on your report or your statement That's or right. his memory right. or her her recollection. We've got a damn video we could play for the jury. Yeah. And so that's yeah. why I think the body-worn cameras are incredibly important. Yeah, I don't it, even bother reading reports until I've seen the, the body cams nowadays. No, it's, 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 um, it's just, I, I, once again, I, I suggested that may very well be it's just a difference in age kind of a thing that she just didn't recognize that that just doesn't work anymore. I mean, we want to see it. (laughs) We are that society. Roll the tape. Roll the tape. We want to see it. Let me interpret what I see. Right. Versus you tell me what what you saw, you know. Right. What you remember seeing, uh-huh, what you think you uh-huh, saw. Uh-huh. So I'm curious to see if that's going to be a change here in Fresno I County don't... as we've got a new administration coming into the sheriff's office. Well, my suspicion is if the new administration is honest with itself and they hear the the talk, and that is that they're losing their ass in trial, they're going to start putting cameras on their officers because they, they can't afford not to. Yeah. You know, and it's just not going to – and and the thought that, that, that somehow that's going to that's gonna, – uh, expose them to more liability for officer misconduct is just ridiculous because it's protective more than it is anything else. And quite frankly, if an officer became an officer because he likes to thump people, he should have a camera on him. So he's not able to do that. And so it's just, it's, it's one of these cycles that they they just need to get up and get caught up with what's going on now in society. I feel like body cameras are an invaluable tool to the justice system. Sure, they can be used by both sides and things like that, but ultimately it's going to help people get to the truth more than simply a witness statement would. 
um, if it's not on camera, the instances of misconduct are on steadier ground, are more shored up because it is on video. And the instances of good conduct can be clarified, can't be misconstrued because it's on video. Yeah. And yeah. so having those cameras is, I think, one of the biggest justice tools that we have. I completely agree. You know, and as we're talking about, it, I was thinking about um, a case that I had recently where, you know, it was a, it was a emotional case. It was a sex case. And the emotions were being used by the prosecution to fill holes into areas of evidence that weren't there. there we had a witness who was, a, was allegedly a victim, who, and that's the only evidence. We need a, we've got a puzzle we're trying to put together, uh -huh. and we need a piece of evidence, but we don't have it, so let's just make the, the emotion piece from a different yeah, puzzle. Yeah, let's fit. fill it in by emotions and make you feel um, sorry for the alleged victim so that way you don't think about what they're saying. Right. Know, don't think too hard. Particularly when they're, what they're saying is different every time they say it. And I remember the officer that was the initial investigator on the case, they put it, the, the DA put her on the stand, and um, she was, you know, asked questions, she roll the video. She rolls the video, and as she's asking her questions after rolling the video, the officer started to get emotional. And I looked at the, uh, the officer, and I looked at the video, and as soon as the district attorney... Um, finished her questioning, I just said to the officer, is that the first time you saw that video? No, I saw it after it happened. That was over three years ago. And I said, I seen you emotionally got involved in, by your actions to watching that video. Is that because you haven't seen it in three years? And she had to, I basically questioned her about her emotions. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, I, and all I did was made a point to that jury that this officer is an advocate She's gotten involved in this case emotionally, and so she's advocating by her emotions. What you've got to do is watch what happened, not what you see her do. Right. Because if you watch the tape, there's an interview done, and the statement made in that interview is different than the statement that the witness just gave you on the stand, is different than the one that the witness gave you at the preliminary hearing, is different from the one that she gave you the next day when I cross-examined her. It's not emotional. you just got to be objective. And so I think, yeah, I think those cameras are going to make a big difference as far as uh, how justice is served and justice occurs in the courtroom. When we were talking about people to podcast and, and like sit down and have a chat about lawyer things with, the first person that came to mind was Chuck McGill, because there's very few people that I can tolerate to sit down and talk to for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I am just so um, blessed to be with somebody you want to be interviewing on a podcast, Shanna. I mean, uh, um, it I, it makes me uh, get all flimped. That's a, that's one of those wonderful Southern words. Means I get emotional when I think about watching you rise from this uh, little girl and with big wide eyes thinking about mock trial and the fact that you had to get up and perform. To be clear, my eyes were wide because you were pulling out a knife. Well, that's one motivation. <laughs> that's one way to see it. So I'm going to choose to see it. That your <laughs> eyes are wide because you're just so excited about the concept of of being an attorney. It's, something, you it's, hadn't, something you hadn't given yourself a lot of thought about at that point in your life, or maybe you had. But the wide-eyed look of it and to see what you've accomplished – in those short years, you know, it's to amazing. To think that I still practice in the same courthouse that I used to compete in, mm -hmm. that I used to sit down and listen to horrific details about my brother's murder in, mm -hmm. that I used to, you know. It's a season. Yeah. It really is. And I'm just, as, a, as the old father of wisdom, I'm just so proud of you. Thanks. I'm so proud of what, you, what you're doing and... You're really lucky if you have her as your attorney, and, and don't miss, 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 don't mistake the fact that you, you hit the freaking lotto, if she's your attorney, because she's going to fight for you. She knows how to fight for you. She knows where you're at. She's been there, and she's going to carry you through it. It's going to be a good experience. It's not going to be 
the negative experience that you've, you've envisioned it to be. I was just sitting down and talking to a friend the other day, and I was telling her, I'm like, you know, the legal system is traumatic enough. Dealing with your lawyer really shouldn't be. But the courtroom is a lot of fun for drama, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite story was that someone said, well, why would you, why would, didn't you become an actor? And I said, well, do you tell me what actor that could have the audience arrested if they left the room that he's in? And I said, and the courtroom, I've got a guy there with a gun. If you try to get up when I'm arguing your closing statement and you're on that jury, by God, you're going to be arrested. Talk what, about could a be captive. Better, what could be better than that for an actor? <laughs> Talk about a captive audience. Absolutely. What could be better than that? I can't think of any, any comedian that has, that has somebody there that's ready to arrest you if you uh, don't like his jokes or you walk off his stage. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah, so it's a, it's a fun place for the drama. Very much. Well, Chuck, thank you for sitting down with me today. Well, thank you for asking me to be here. I appreciate it. You're welcome. If you enjoyed that podcast, please feel free to check us out at Trauma Law CA on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, or check out some of our other videos or share with a friend for some more legal content. <laughs>